Welcome back to the Team Nerd Herd podcast, where our best advice is if you want to do it right, collect what you like. Now, Team Herd, Nerd Herd, we are super excited to bring you yet another creative comic book spotlight interview, a segment we like to call, What If We Don't Shut the F Up? Today, you'll find out. Now, we are super excited to bring you our intro that y'all been waiting for. Ross Ritchie, founder, CEO of Boom Studios. Now, he has won nine diamond comic distributors count them nine nine times guys new series of berserker created by keanu reeves and over 625,000 copies becoming the biggest launch in comic book shops in nearly 30 years y'all 30 years he is executive producing the disney plus tv just beyond currently in production in atlanta based on the best-selling boom graphic novel series from Goosebumps creator R.L. Stein. Boom! Just launched a new Magic the Gathering series based on billion dollar on the billion dollar franchise card game, which will go be on sale in comic book shops in April. Mark your calendars, y'all, because I know I am. Entitled Magic, it's the biggest selling Magic the Gathering comic book series in nearly 25 years, y'all. Let's bring him in. Let's give him a warm welcome. Ross Ritchie, welcome to the show, Ross. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for having me, y'all. How are you? Doing good. Great. Right. Good. 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 Thanks for coming. Stoked. It's a lot of fun. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you for ha- thank you for even coming in, Ross. We're super excited. We are big fans of Boom Studios. Uh, I know I have all these titles on my poll and I've been collecting since the time of getting back into comic book collecting. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. I think we're all big fans, man. Big, we're all big fans of yeah. Boom. And um, Boom is just like, Boom has the best the best stories right now, the best books. You know, like you guys are hitting out of the park with everything that you guys come out with. So, Thank you. Well, we have a very, uh, we have a brilliant editorial team that works really, 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 really hard and an incredible marketing team. And, uh, you know, great designers, great production team. Uh, but it is, I'm here because I have a brilliant staff uh, who's super talented. Awesome. Yeah. You guys remind me a lot of uh, Dark Horse in the 90s, like the heyday of Dark Horse. In the sense of just a, you're not the number the top two, but you're right there with them. You know what I mean? Thank you. You're putting out Thank material that mm-hmm. everyone wants to read. Well, Dark Horse is an excellent company. So yeah. uh, I, I have a very high opinion of Dark Horse. So thank you for the compliment. Appreciate it. No problem. Yeah. So uh, Ross, let me ask you. Uh, like, we always like to start off with like uh, origins. You know, um, where did you pick up your first comic book, and what comic book was that? Well, my mom got an Easter basket when I was six for me, and she went and bought a Captain America and a Fantastic Four comic, and she oh, cut the wow. top of the Easter basket open and slipped them in sealed the top and uh that uh blew me away and and for me it was being six and seeing the fantastic four and thinking one guy is made of rocks and the other guy is made of fire i want to be made of rocks and i want to be made of fire (laughs) and i have the distinct memory of being in the back seat of the car and seeing the numbers in the number box and thinking because I think it was 178, and I, I remember thinking, um, if there's 177 stories before this, I need to get them all. I need to, I need to read them all. It's very cool. So, so, so did you, did you oh. end up getting them all? <laughs> there you go. You know? That's the question. <laughs> yeah, that was my question, Alonzo. You took That's it away. From <laughs> nice, nice play, Alonzo. If I, if I did have them all, I would never tell you when I go on vacation, and you'd never know where I lived. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I can uh, like this, like Alonzo. I, I, I can recognize eyes on you. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta watch. You gotta watch out for him, Ross. I gotta tell you. Uh, if, you I, if you need a, if you need a profile picture, Ross, I can, I can email it to you. Just uh, don't worry about it, man. <laughs> uh, all right. All right. <laughs> 
But uh, yeah, the uh, I ended up reading them all. I got them in a reprint or a collection of some kind all the way through for sure. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Got some. Got some. I grew up in Texas. Got some Mexican reprints. Oh, Texas! <laughs> oh man. my God. That's Mexican, cool. and I don't. I don't have them anymore because you know, for years and years and years, uh, foreign language editions were you, you know uh, disliked, and and now they're all the rage. And yeah. I wish I had my Mexican editions. Yeah, all those so, foreign editions that they have nowadays. It's mm -hmm. like whoa. Yeah. Yeah. So are you excited stuff. for the Fantastic Four movie eventually? Oh, uh, that is something that will truly give me an immeasurable amount of joy. Nice. The um, There's a quality that I think, there's something really magical about uh, Kevin Feige mm -hmm. and how he mm -hmm. uh, creates these this material. And, you know, I've produced movies. I've made two movies. And so I work at Hollywood. And the thing that is so hard to um, explain to people that don't work in Hollywood is in the conventional studio system, um, people are constantly, even today, they're scared when they make superhero material that it'll be goofy because people have suits on, uh, costumes, and you know, there's a lot of wacky uh, out there ideas. And um, I think what Feige does so brilliantly is he understands how to make it fun and it's really emotional and it's really true. Uh, and the characters are really powerful, um, but it's a lot of fun. And um, the Fantastic Four is that the characters are really powerful. It's a family relationship. But the thing that the, that first hundred issues with Stan and Jack has is it has a sense of adventure and fun. I mean, we know, I mean, the Incredibles, is not quiet about the fact that they tapped into yeah. the Fantastic Four for, for inspiration. Now, it's not the only thing. They obviously tapped into James Bond for inspiration as well. But um, that kind of bouncy fun uh, with a, a real sense of adventure, I think they're going to really crush that. And I think it's going to be – I'll, I'll probably cry. <laughs> so on another front, I mean, eventually we know – Several of your titles are going to end up becoming TV shows and movies and that type of thing. Do you look forward to knowing that you're going to do that? What what you just explained, which is mm -hmm. awesome for – I've never heard from Fantastic Four fan. That that kind of detail, that love for it. You've got people that love a lot of your titles like There's Something Killing the Children. Oh, my God. And yep. I mean because – I mean it's just an amazing book. And you've got Berserker. I could see. I've seen people pick up Berserker. The people know me as comic book nerd and work. And they come up to me and go, "Did you read this?" And I mean, it's like that's good. Yeah, to yeah. Duh. Uh, <laughs> how does it feel knowing that you're going to have eventually, ten years down the road, when these become major properties? I mean, they're they're big properties, but you're on you're on the small level, right? You're going to blow up eventually. I mean, bigger and bigger. Yeah. yeah. How does it feel to know that someone's as reverent as you spoke about Fantastic Four, they're going to be speaking that way about your stuff? Well, I, you know, what I try to do as much as I can in my job is to try to create an environment for talented creators to come in and tell their stories to support them, but at the same time to provide resources to them that help shape the story and help shape the marketing and supports them all the way through. And I really feel like it's my job to try to pick the best next franchise. That's always been interesting to me. I'm going to jump ahead and, and I'm sure out of the chronology of what the series of questions you've got, but I went into the comic book business. I like, let me back up and say, I read every single Marvel and DC comic I could get my hands on from the age of six until like 13. And when I was 13, I discovered independent comics. And that blew my mind because that was like, for me, it was going on a tightrope without a net. It was these, this is the next Batman. This is the next X-Men you know, which one of these things is not bound by continuity and it's not limited um, 
by the fact that, you know, I at, at a certain point when I was like 10, I figured that the Joker was always going to come back, right? Mm. So Joker's mm -hmm. gonna break out and Batman's going to catch him, and then the Joker's going to break out, and Batman's going to catch him. We're just going to do that, right? And then we'll do it with the Riddler, and we'll do it with Penguin. And I love Batman, and I have a million Batman comics, so I'm not knocking Batman. But with, you know, a series from back in the day, like the Elementals or John Sable Freelance. Oh, I love that book. You didn't have any idea what was going to happen. And I can't even tell you how exciting it was from that era because it, it it was happening in front of you. It was like this vista was opening up of these brand new publishers and they were had top talent, the most exciting creators, and they were telling these rip roaring franchise stories. And you you felt like you were, you know, I don't know how to say you're on the roller coaster and you have no track. You know, mm -hmm. it was like, whoa. And so for me, I feel like my that's what's interesting to me is to go out, let's go do stuff. We're going to go do something that's killing the children. And I remember sitting down with a final copy two weeks before it came out. I sat down in the office. I, I you know kept up with it the whole time, but sat down and read it stem to stern. And then going and talking to the staff and going talking about how, how big I thought that the book was going to be. And then to see people understand Erica Slaughter and mm -hmm. that click in. And then we could see in the sales patterns as we went through the reprints. And then as we were going into the trade collections, more people onboarding and more people onboarding and more people onboarding. And I look at her, I think she is a massively iconic. Oh, yeah. Her? Definitely. I, I'd have to agree wholeheartedly. Yep. Werther's character design is brilliant. And I mean, I mean, once a generation level brilliant, but James has embedded in the heart of her. She's like, it reminds me, uh, and this is going to be a dated reference, but when, in the Mad Max franchise, Road Warrior, like when Mad Max shows up at that village to save that village from the great humongous and Road Warrior, it, it was a huge moment. It's like the man with no name. That's who mm -hmm. Eric Slaughter is. She shows up out of nowhere. Here's this town that's in trouble. And she doesn't, you don't know anything about her. She didn't have the, you know, the, the background's not clear. I mean, that's a classic. That goes back to Yojimbo. You know, there's yeah. just a, it taps so many hugely mythic stories. Mm -hmm. And and I look at that and I go, I am, you know, you'll hear bands talk about they're in the service to the great song. And they say that in all caps, right? They're right. chasing the great song. And sometimes it comes to them and sometimes it doesn't, right? And that's how, that's how thanks Alonzo, I love it. And that's how I feel, you know, it's like I am in service to the great story. And I try to create an environment for it to come visit us. And I try to, you know, honor certain story principles that I see and that I share with editorial and it's like, hopefully that great story comes and visits us. And I think we've been very lucky to have many of those come across our plate in the past. I mean, for, you know, I've been doing this for 15 years. It's happened for us many times that I'm very thankful for, but you know, it's been an incredible sales run this past uh, 18 months. So yeah. that that's what I'm chasing. That's, and, and I think at the end of the day, if you service the great story, great things happen. And I think that has been done on Once in Future and it's been done on Something's Killing the Children. And yep. we worked really hard on it on Berserker. Like I can't tell you how much time Keanu put into that. Like you would not believe me. Like aside from the time before he worked with us, which I know he worked on it really hard. But like we would do, I attended with him at least six, four hour story conferences. Wow. And there were a lot more than that. Hmm. Yeah. And I know Matt Kent, we interviewed him last week and mm -hmm. he was saying that he would do like eight hour, 10 hour sessions yeah. mm -hmm. yes. with him over Skype over the last couple of years. He was doing this. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. I can one, one time, you know, <laughs> this is the thing is, you know, I'm sure y'all think about this in this like gilded skyscraper way, but you know, it's not like that. Right. And so we were trying to get more story done and we were just running out of time. And Keanu was like, let's get together on Saturday and we will start with coffee and we'll end with bourbon. 
<laughs> oh, oh dang you're like <laughs> just pack, pack it up guys it's gonna be a long night <laughs> how did the wife feel about that <laughs> She's I, like, oh. I had a negotiation man because i got i got kids i That's got what i'm little, saying man i got i got little kids and and you know one of the things that you see in that is he didn't accidentally become one of the biggest movie stars in the world like he works mm -hmm. he works really hard and he's very focused and it's very intentional. Like, you know, we, we were uh, enjoying um, a little while back, uh, it's probably like six weeks ago, um, Clem Robbins, the letterer, was talking to uh, Keanu and Keanu finally got a chance to really drill down and start to quiz Clem about lettering. And uh -huh. like, he wanted to know everything. Huh. Like, like, I-, I what, Interesting. I've, I've had to explain to him, he asked me such specifics about comic book distribution. You would be shocked about. I, I can only imagine. I, I was telling Matt uh, when we were interviewing Matt, I said, I wish I was on a fly on the wall when that story was pitched. And uh, he kind of went into a little bit of detail, but that was, that, that was going to be my next follow-up question is how, how did that become you know, where, where did Keanu come into, you know, where did the path come in with Boom Studios and how was uh, his pitch and everything down to the granular levels? I mean, I know he, he's been writing this story and he's had this vision, but um, how is it all brought to you? Well, we are very active in Hollywood. Like I said, I produced two movies. We just had a movie come out uh, last Halloween, The Empty Man, which has been oh, yes, yes. on Rotten Tomatoes, which is nice to see. And, uh, and we're shooting Just Beyond in Atlanta right now. And so we're very well known amongst the Hollywood talent agencies. And we're very lucky because a lot of the agents are fans. And so... Keanu had, knew that he wanted to do a comic and his agent said, um, you should pitch it to Boom. Hmm. And so, um, you know, I, I basically got the call and, you know, I have a, a picture on my phone that no one will ever see, which is that um, you get a special parking space on the, on the, on the lot, on the movie lot. Right. So I have a little placard and it has my name, Ross Ritchie Boom Studios. Now, it seems ritzy. It's, it seems like five star hotel that, you know, you have your own parking space. And I'm going to disabuse you of some of the excitement of that. That's <laughs> to make sure that nobody parks like, you know, parking's a free fall, free for all. Yeah. And so it's like if if you didn't have that, you'd, you'd have to walk like three miles to be able to get to your office. Jeez. So oh, it's goodness. not, it, it, they, it's a preventative move more than a, than a deluxe edition, right? But anyway, <laughs> they, um, we made arrangements and I needed to park somewhere else that day. And so Keanu, you know, rode his motorcycle. And so there was this picture of Keanu's motorcycle in my <laughs> face, right? You know, Ross Ritchie, Keanu's <laughs> motorcycle, which is crazy. And, and I'll tell you, uh, I'll jump ahead to the second meeting briefly because the first meeting he came in and, you know, you obviously don't want him to wait too long, but um, I, there's another part of you that's like, you're going into the room and you're freaking out mm -hmm. right? as you're like, Oh, I, you know, this sounded like a great idea, but now I'm about to crap my pants. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sounds smooth, Steve. Uh, then, we'll we'll get know. to that later. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, but, but, and so he was there and he, he spoke to the assistant and, when he came back in the second time, um, same situation. You don't want him to be waiting, but you also have to like wrap up your call and close your computer and, you know, go get your act together and uh, maybe get a cup of coffee. And um, he had listened to the assistant. And the second time he came in, he was like, hey, uh, Zoe. So he remembered her name and was hmm. like, how's your dog? You know, how's your boyfriend? And like, I was stunned. You know, it's like, I can't remember wow. what my wife sent me to the grocery store for. <laughs> you know, and I mean, really? Yeah. Right? That's the thing where I'm like, what am I doing in the grocery You know, <laughs> and, uh, and here's this guy. And, uh, and you know, I know that he carries a book and he writes everything down. And he, you know, wow. he's really focused and pays attention. So anyway, so he came in. 
I, you know, hi, 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 you know, a little bit of chitter chatter, you know, traffic's crazy, blah, 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 blah. And then, and we're all sitting on couches and then he stood up and he was just like, I, I just really want to punch through dudes. I just want to, and when I say punch through dudes, like I want to put my fist through a dude and pull his spine out. Like I want to punch through a guy's face. And when I say, I'm not saying punch a guy in the face. I'm saying I want to punch like my elbow goes yeah. through the back of his head. He was That's like awesome. Standing up and like acting it out, you know? And he was like, this is this, I've got this idea and it's, this is the kind of personality and this is the character and here's what he's doing. And I have these snatches of different sort of scenes I see in my head and, you know, and he would sit there and act it out. The first page of Berserker, he'd be like, you know, I'm sitting and I'm hunched over yeah. and I'm on the bus bench and it's in the rain. And, you know, we were all like, oh my God, he's pitching us the sad Keanu mean. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's what we all thought. That's too. what we thought. Yeah. That's, that's what we thought. He was. Yeah. Yes. yes. He's no dummy. He knows what he's doing. And so we were just like, whoa. <laughs> I guess the appropriate response would be, whoa. Yeah. But um, <laughs> you know, and, and yeah, I can't. I can't even begin. Like to me either. Play. Steve could do it. Steve could do it. Do it, Steve. <laughs> he could do it. Steve could do it. Whoa! Oh, that's, <laughs> that that's was good, good right? <laughs> Very good. That's and, how I felt. <laughs> and, you know, and like four hours later, you know, we he was like, "Do you want to do that?" And we we're like, "Yes." And he said, "Okay, we'll get uh, Raphael Grandpa to do the cover." And we had had conversations about his familiarity with comics, but I think at that moment, he was kind of going, hey, I know my stuff, right? Like, I know who Raphael is, and, and I'm calling this shot, and I'm going to challenge you. You know, like, if you can't get Raphael, like, you, know, you, better, you better make it happen. Yes. Right. And so um, that was uh, a very uh, powerful moment because it was like a spirit of partnership. It was like, we're going to work on this together. And this isn't a thing that you're just going to go take and run off and go do it and show up at the finish line and be like, look at this. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. I'm, we're going to get Raphael Grandpa to do this cover. And it's like, we were like, okay, let's go. Mm -hmm. So. And it's such an amazing cover. I mean, that it's when like to see the other incentives down to like. Well, I, I'm a cover A guy through and through. So for me, I was amazed to see it just there. You know, like we've been hearing about it, and and just the whole build up and everything like that. And you got some heavy hitters and Keanu, no less. I mean, writing it, you're just like, oh my god, this is going to be a movie hands down for sure you know now you know we're seeing it come to fruition and other things are just kind of tumbling down it's just amazing to see and the story itself was so hot I, I look at it like that's what a comic should be it's action-packed the panels kind of speak for themselves the, the the story is just enough to hook you and say I issue two and all the way through issue 12 so i mean when i was reading this this was i, I got the trifecta with matt kent so i got yep. you know ENIAC and i got fear case but berserker was the first one i read first i said i have to put this down i need to read it and i had to sit and really like marinate on it because it was just such an amazing title and i just thought to myself you guys this is going to be big I, I can already tell you within these 12 issues that they have because it's just going to be a long series this this is the one to get and, and, I'll be uh, honest, and I'll be honest, Ross, I was 50 50 on it because, I was like, ah, you know, Keanu's writing it, and it's going to be, you know, it's going to be this movie actor who's coming out to try to do a, you know, a comic book with us, for us, like, or not even for us. He's doing it for, like, you know, the general public, you know, like, because a lot of people know Berserker that aren't comic book guys. But I got to tell you, man, I really enjoyed it as a comic book guy. I was like, damn, like, this is how a comic book should be. Like yeah. not much dialogue and all, and and, and the story brings you oh. in through art. Yes. Also, like, yep. Well, I, I'll, 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 just to hop in really quick, you know, the thing about it is that Matt Gagnon, who's our editor in chief, he was the one that cast uh, Matt Kent to be with Keanu, and so we were rolling the dice. You know, it's like you call up Keanu 
excuse me, you call it Kent, Kent and Keanu, Keanu and Kent, you call it Kent <laughs> and uh, you go, hey, you know, nobody's going to pitch this thing better to you than Keanu Reeves and replicating his pitch is fairly difficult. So why don't you hop on a plane and come out and listen to the pitch and maybe it's your thing and maybe it's not. And um, Kent rolled the dice and trusted us. We'd done series together before and, and it had been positive experience. And so um, I think the thing that was really very smart on Matt Gagnon's end and putting Matt Kent in with Keanu is Keanu has a very artistic and I mean that with a capital A, artistic sensibility. And he's done a lot of art movies that you have not seen. You know, like they're little tiny indie movies. There's a bunch of them, you know. Everybody's seen the blockbusters. But go look. Like, there's a staggering amount of, like, really arty stuff that he's done. And the um, having him, you know, match that to Kent who can be very artistic as well. Yep, yep. Yes. Incredibly arty. Okay. Now I look at that sometimes and I worry that that, you know, you put those two together and you're going to end up with something that's really ponderous and sort of what is the nature of man? And, you know, we're going to be staring into the cosmos and what the hell is this comic about? Right. But I think what was amazing is Kent has a dedication to his craft. And so what Kent really did was he gave, Kent was looking for a language and a vocabulary. Like, mm -hmm. I know what this story is. How do I, how do comics work? How do I form it? I know how comics work, but how do comics work, right? Like you've watched a movie, but can you go make a movie? Like that's really hard, right? Mm -hmm. And Kent really stepped into that and gave him a structure and a framework. And then one of the things that was interesting was Kent became his enabler. Okay. <laughs> Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, uh, no. What do you think? It's <laughs> a good thing. <laughs> right. But, yeah, see, but, but, see, <laughs> but see, that's why my editor-in-chief is so brilliant, is that he could see the one plus one equals three of it. But like, for instance, the reason it's oversized, that issue, is Kent. Right? And so Keanu's going, I want to do this and this and this and this and this. And Kent's figuring it all out. And he's like, I gotta, we gotta, we gotta go big on this thing. Like we gotta put a lot into this first issue. And I was like, oh, it's more expensive and that's harder. And like, you know, it's gonna drive the cover price up and that's gonna make some people jump off board. And we want everybody to really be able to have a shot at this. So a lot of considerations, right? But Kent's instincts were correct. And when I say he was the enabler, the way that Kent worked with Keanu was Keanu wanted to go crazy crazy okay and your instinct whenever you're with somebody like that i don't care like think back in high school you're with your best friend or you know college or whatever you're at a concert something and your best friend's like let's go nuts you know, like, <laughs> ah, can we just maybe like can we pull it back a notch i know we need to blow off some steam but can you pull it? you know kent was like let's go right and so kent was like further more yeah. he's like right. i'll take the red pill with you keanu yeah. let's go yes right. yes right yeah. and, and, and so the combination becomes this runaway freight train of the first issue <laughs> where you know Kent That's has dope. an understanding of structure and so he understands how to contain it because there would have been a way that it would have been unsatisfying right where it had been like Blood! yes <sighs> you'd have been like well what the hell was this Right. Yeah. But he didn't really understood like, okay, we need to like structure it like this and da, 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 da. But by the way, Keanu, turn it up to Spinal Tap 11. Like, let's see if it goes to 12. Let's go <laughs> great. Like, let's see if we can break this. Right. It most certainly did. It most that that's yeah. you just you just clearly gave the perfect synopsis of it because it was high octane uh, true to the fact i mean he pulls out the spine he punches through a person brain fragments are everywhere it's just an it was just an amazing ride can, well, can i ask you something ross can i ask you something like uh you know i haven't you're seeing, the darning yet though but go but ahead you're see, but yeah. you're seeing it you're seeing them going like kent kent's going to keanu let's go let's go to let's go to 15 decimals were you ever worried bro like you're like oh shit man i don't know where this is gonna go like were you ever worried the entire time 
<laughs> got that, bro. Always. Yes. Yes. Every step of the way. Yes. Yeah. You know, you, it's just your, it's wildfire, right? You know, it's either going to really mm -hmm. work, but you know, part of what I think you've got to do is you got to, you got to, you know, you, you, the great hitters don't get up to plate and think, let's not hit a home run. Yeah. Right. You go like, well, we're either striking out or we're hitting a home run. And the thing is, is if you'd have looked at the book and been like, well, this is just absolutely God awful, terrible. I would have been like, well, at least we tried. Right. As opposed to like, we tried to like, uh, overthink it and you know we we got scared right but you know but i want to get to garney because what ron ron is such a multi-level talent so the first thing that you get is here's a guy with 30 years of experience mm -hmm. okay so he so there's a confidence and a knowledge that's on every single page you know it's like i don't know how you feel about music but it's like when you're in the hands of a legendary singer, mm -hmm. like you can just feel it in the first oh, five yeah. seconds of the song, right? Yep. You're just like, wow, this guy's Frank Sinatra, man, he, he's not worried about a thing. I'm just gonna kick back and listen to this guy, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's Garney, and you can feel his hands on the wheel. And mm -hmm. then the thing that I think is hard to see in the book because there's so much going on is his emotion and acting and the body postures and the character faces. Mm -hmm. So it isn't just about like, you know, um, the pyrotechnics, right? Ron does all that. You know, like when he jumps out of that helicopter, you feel it. Oh like yeah. When he lands. You feel it. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really hard to do. Like I can't, Some like if we were at a convention, I would, and no one was around so that nobody thought I was disparaging anybody's work, I would pull 10 comics off a rack and I would show you how hard it is to do, right. to give things weight, to do backgrounds that are detailed, to do the, mm -hmm. the page layouts, they cohere, cohesive pages. That's a little invisible thing that most people are not hip to is the page has to have a design beyond just the panels. Mm -hmm. And Ron just does all of that and he does it seamlessly and you add this sort of desire to break free that Kent and Keanu have and this, you know, sort of tiger by the tail kind of like sensation and you put that in the hands of somebody like Ron Garney and it's like, God help you, man, because it's just yeah. like, I, I just felt like I got punched in the face when I read that comic. And then the nice thing is when, at least when I read it, because I'm the old skeptic, I mean, I've been collecting for 30 some odd years. I was going, oh, here goes here goes another Hollywood guy who wants to another freaking comic. But you guys actually had respect for the for the fans. You know what I mean? Yep. It, it's you didn't go, okay, here's your money, ha ha ha. Here, take this. You actually gave us a book that we go, well, shit, this is good. This is freaking really good. good. Yeah. I, Jr., I'm going to tell you a secret. I am looking for you every time I publish. You feel special, Jr. Yeah, you I always knew I was special. My mom told me this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, you, and you got a face only your mother could love. <laughs> Look at the, he's blushing. Anyways. You got him blushing, Ross. Look at that. Look at that. Look at the cheeks. I'm a, bring me the cranky old skeptic. That's that's that. Yep. There he is. There he is. I'm gonna I'm gonna kick his ass. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna fill his heart with hope. I'm gonna make him love things again. Uh, you know that's oh, the, that's JR, yeah. that's JR man. <laughs> that, 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 if you can make that. me love Spider Man, you've done amazing things. I'm I, I want to make the next Spider Man. Yeah, oh, man. Yes. 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 And, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Me now, too. now it's, one it's thing, the next Spider Man could be yeah. Erica. No, no, I want to ask. I want to ask you about this. Erica, this is the next um, Batman. That's yeah, Erica's true. next Batman, or or even Moon Knight. Can we can we talk about Erica she's, and uh, something skin the children real quick? She's bigger than Moon Knight. Oh yeah, yeah, oh. she is. She is. She is. She's gonna. Pay be. her respects. She's, she I is. Bought, she's gonna be. I bought Moon Knight number one off the rack. Bill Sienkiewicz is a friend oh, of mine. Wow. Oh I, my god, I, I revere Bill Sienkiewicz, but Bill Sienkiewicz is holy to me. Okay, he is. He's holy but, to all us, all of us here. He's but <laughs> Erica Slaughter is bigger than Moon Knight. Oh no, I believe it. Just our friend Nick loves Moon Knight, so. Yeah, I had to throw that in there. 
I understand. I understand. As I said, I, I bought the first issue off the rack, so I'm I'm in that club. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah. um, oh yeah. Can I just want to? I want to co- come back to Erica because that's one of our, our this podcast. Like we love something's killing the children. Oh yeah, it's so dope, man. Um, and it came at the right time. You said like you know all these things kind of intertwined and make this a real special book. And I think even like the pandemic made it even more special because of the mask. You yeah. know. Um, what do you, how do you think pen, the pandemic has changed the comic book industry? Do you think it's changed it for the good or bad? I think it's, it's made things better. And I don't think it's made things better because people have suffered and died because that's horrible. And I don't think it's made things better. Um, in that I know that a lot of people have been struggling financially or they've been struggling in their careers. And I know fans have lost their jobs and I know some shops have closed. So I don't want to be insensitive to any of that. But what I have seen in the retail community is that stores are up and they're up big on the year before. And there's a lot of discussion happening like um, Coliseum of Comics is the biggest brick and mortar store in Florida, well, in nationally, and they're located in Florida. And they're opening, they're in the process of opening two new stores because mm-hmm. that's how much sales are up. And I know uh, that the bank issue business or aftermarket is rocking. You know, I can Mm -hmm. just see it. It's going crazy. You see all that back there? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm very interested in it. it. (laughs) Um, uh, But but yeah, and and, and of course, the aftermarket is not indicative of um, how the, the, the sort of publishing business is necessarily. Those are two different things. But I think that it is key for comic book shop health. And there are some stores that don't carry back issues and there are some that do. And um, when things turn into a crisis and it's scary, it's good to see the guys that have an opportunity to, you know, a lot of folks put their books online for the first time, got a website, they started doing um, eBay sales, they started you know, putting um, stuff up on um, uh, Facebook shows and selling direct to fans. And they needed to do all those things. And um, I, my understanding is most everybody on a publishing basis, their sales are up. So um, I think tremendous amount of fear, very scary. Um, for us, we're through the roof, you know. So it's been gigantic for us. I think we're up some staggering number, like 20% which um, is gigantic. I can't explain to you in the publishing business how big a number that is. So uh, it's been huge for us. So I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful and grateful. And it's because we have a very resilient staff who's very strong and adaptable and flexible. Well, one thing also I know, I mean, at least I was talking to my local comic shop owner um, here in Sacramento, and he, he loves you guys. He Thank says, you. you guys take care of them. You guys with, if if it's damages you guys take care of it with through diamond and all that but also just in general he's you guys kind of stood while other i'm not going to throw anyone under the bus but while other companies kind of stepped away you guys kind of stepped up during the pandemic well and he appreciates that I'll, i'll break it down further and i will name names but i think everybody involved uh made sound decisions So when the pandemic hit, so one of the things that was happening was area, different states and different cities and localities were reacting differently. Mm -hmm. And so there wasn't any clarity. And one of the problems with, with sort of national distribution with comics and, you know, for heaven's sakes, Canada too, I don't mean to leave them out, but it's like, I, I could go online and I could see. I'm just going to pick some names out of a hat, right? Atlanta looks like it's going to close, but New York is open, right? Mm -hmm. And now you're going to face a situation where Atlanta is going to have Batman and New York isn't. And that's a thankless moment, right? Like everybody loses. Mm -hmm. And nobody in comics wants people to suffer at a retail basis, right? The publishers, the distributors, and the other retailers don't want any of that. Everyone wants to be together, right? So you started to see things fragment and there was, it was clear that there was going to be some hard decisions that were going to need to be made. And then it got worse, which was 
that retailers started to figure out that they're going to get shut down. Everyone's going to get shut down. And what they were worried about was product coming in that they had already committed to buy with no buyers. Yeah. And what is the cash flow going to look like? And what's my outlook? You know, and, and it's terrifying, right? Like, are we going to be shut down two weeks? Are we going to be shut down six months? And so what retailers did at that point is they broke the glass and they pulled in case of emergency. And what they did was they went to Marvel in DC and they said, don't ship anything. Do not ship anything. Yeah. And Marvel in DC listened and they were scared. And they said, this is frightening. We hear you. And so they pulled their schedule way back. Mm -hmm. Now that's those operations are battleships. They're huge aircraft carriers. They are hard to turn. They take time, right? Yeah. Think about artist schedules, right? You know, are you going to like, are you going to underwrite? I, I wouldn't be surprised. I'm going to pull some numbers out of the air, but just to give you a sense of the size of the crisis. Okay. Make a decision right now. You're spending $5 million a week for people to write and draw comics. Make a decision now. Do you spend the $5 million and you don't have any product to ship? Are you going to spend five? It's probably more like 10 million on a cost basis. Mm -hmm. So you're going to start burning your cash to generate product that you can't make, that you can't sell to retail, and you don't know for how long, right? Right. So I don't envy any of those choices that were made by Marvel and DC. They pulled way back and I think they did a great job. They had a lot at stake and they were trying to back retailers up. And that's a really hard decision to make. Um, and we're much smaller. And what I was looking at was how do we get across, how do we bridge this gap? I was worried about the staff. Everybody else had let staff go. I was worried about if you let people go in the pandemic, how are they going to get a job? Right? So I was really worried about the staff. I was really worried about the writers and the artists because bills keep coming. It's not like you don't pay the light bill, you know, because a pandemic's happening. So if I'm writing and drawing, you slow my checks down. I'm screwed. Right? So I kept those guys going. And I looked on it, like when, when it started to reopen, I started to go into the store and I was looking at everything really closely. And what I was seeing was we, there was not product out, right? Because Marvel and DC had pulled back and Marvel had completely not shipped product and DC had taken like one month's worth of product and split it out over two to try to make the bills more affordable for the retailers. And nobody knew if fans were going to come back to the shops. And think about on an implementation basis, you remember the different amount of information that we got about how communicable the, the, the virus was and it would change, Yep. right? And the CDC was just figuring it out. And so as a retailer, you're trying to visualize, well, how the hell am I going to open, right? And do I want to open? Do I only want to do curbside? Am I going to do it through a window like a lunch counter or like, what the hell am I going to do? Right. Mm -hmm. And so I was going to the shops as soon as they opened to try to evaluate what is the status of retail. And what I saw was there was not product. And I thought that's an opportunity. And we continued to keep people on staff. We continue to make comics. We're going to barrel forward. And what we did was we made everything returnable and nobody had had done that. People had done returnable programs before, but nobody had made everything returnable. And the reason we did that was we didn't know if fans were going to show up and we weren't going to stick a bunch of products with retailers that they couldn't sell and have them hate us for the next 10 years or have a negative association with our product. And so we said, we're just going to grab hands with you and we're both going to jump off this cliff together and there's either going to be water down there or there's not. And if there's no water down there, you're, you know, the retailers are screwed, distribution screwed and publishers are screwed and we're all screwed. Right. So I'm not going to sit here and try to throw you in front of the bus, you know, 
we're partners. We're going to do this together. And we got insanely lucky because we're comic book people. So when the shops opened, you know, comics is a community and the fans showed up and the fans found things to buy because they knew that the retailer needed the money. Yep. Yep. And they supported their local comic shops. Yep. And it was a huge, huge moment. And these shops, you know, I would go into them and they're rocking and there's no product in it that's new. So that's when what I did with wind was I knew that we had an entirely finished graphic novel that was in our pocket that was going to come out that fall. And Tynan had been behind punchline with Batman, which was just about to take off like a rocket when the pandemic hit. Did you hear that JR? Skepticism again. Well, take that. That's all right. That's all right. I, it, it, Jerry, you might not like the character or the story, but the economic phenomenon of its success is undeniable. Oh, no, I don't mind the character. I just, it was kind of like when the Red Goblin came out a couple of years ago, and everyone's like, oh my God, this is amazing, this is amazing. And then they kill him off in like six issues. Gotcha. I was predicting they'd do the same thing with Punchline because it's just a knockoff of Harley Quinn. Gotcha. So with punchline coming i kept trying to figure out when punchline was going to come mm -hmm. which james even if james could tell me which he could not because that's confidential information for dc comics but even if he could tell me the shipping schedules were getting rearranged weekly so we just had to like take a shot and go okay we're going to take this graphic novel that he did we're going to split it into individual issues and we're going to put it out into comic shops. And, you know, my president of publishing, Philip Sablett, came to me and said, we can't do that. And I said, why? And he said, to send the email to Diamond that has the information in it, that then gets collated to go into the printed catalog, which is previews, which coincidentally I have here right now. Okay, so that takes 30 days. And then you got to print previews, and that takes two weeks, maybe three weeks, truck it everywhere. Everybody gets the catalog, they have it for a month, and then you got to collate the orders, and then you got to go to FOC. He's like, it's, you know, you don't have time. You physically don't have time. And I was like, well, what if we just skip all that? And what if we just go digital? And we just go straight to the retailers digitally and say, this is the book. We'll give it to you as a PDF. You can read it and figure out if you want to order it. And, you know, Savlik was like, well, nobody's ever done it before. And I said, well, then that's why we should do it. And um, he said, well, Diamond's never going to agree to that. And, you know, we called Diamond and Diamond was totally up for it because Diamond knew that the product, there wasn't product in the channel. And so they understood uh, our instinct. And so that's another sort of like, look, you just get up and you take your swing and you're going for the home run. And that one was a home run. That that book was our best selling original title at that point time and then it got that got shattered by seven secrets and that got shattered by we only find them when they're dead and that got shattered by berserker and so um it's just built and built and built and built but with wind it was an opportunity and and you know i feel like life is full of challenges and you've got to figure out are you going to decide that you can't handle these challenges when you get out of bed in the morning or are you going to say this challenge presents me an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like what we did during the pandemic was we looked at it as an opportunity to tell the retailers that we were there for them and to show it because we are and we believe it. We don't just say it. And I'm not saying other people just say it. I'm just saying we just that's who we are. Mm -hmm. And it's a spirit of partnership and that we had an opportunity to do something innovative. And, and you know, Tynan is brilliant and um, you know, uh, Michael Dialinis, who is the artist on that series, did the woods for us. And they're a powerful creative team. And we knew it was an opportunity to spotlight super talented creators and get more attention. So this should be called Ross Rants. 
Oh no, Speaking this is this has been a real treat. I mean, for me, I when you were talking about wind, that's where I kind of picked up, Ross. So I picked up with wind, and then went into Seven Secrets, and then went into We Only Find Them When They're Dead. So each title that was coming in, even the or like I I got Origins, I got Mega Man, fully charged, and I mean I have a lot, a huge catalog of Boom books, and I, I mean I was amazed by each title. I'm like, oh my god, I just when is when when is the next title going to come out? So for me, it, it's okay. it's been a, a real treat. So this has been great, a great breakdown. I, I mean, I've been waiting for this it's like weeks and weeks. I'm like, oh my god, I can't I wait. It. I appreciate it. Jr. was probably uh, cocked his head skeptically and said, mm. "No, no, actually, <laughs> it, it's funny because I knew about your guys's like we always we started Comic Con together. That's where we mm -hmm. all met. Mm -hmm. And one of our buddies named Roy, he'd always drag me over to the Boom booth, and I'd go, "Why are you dragging me to the Power Ranger booth again? Because for a long time." That was your your big thing mm -hmm. and up until probably about last year probably earlier than that i always kind of like your books not trying to mean but i was just like uh power rangers is not voltron and i don't care about um steve universe yep. but i mean now you're pulling i mean even like berserker is amazing but you also brought in proctor road proctor valley road with yes. Grant morrison which, to me, that's that's huge because Grant Morrison, I, I love. I love all those English writers. And you really don't see him do much anymore. Mm -hmm. And he's he's reined in a little bit. Because I love Grant, but he's, he's done some stuff like The Filth where it's just, yeah, that was aptly titled. Uh, I don't ever need to read that book again. Um, well, I warn know. people, don't read that book. <laughs> I, I'm very proud of the fact, if Grant was here, I would tease him with this. I'm very proud of the fact that I can actually understand him when he talks. So he has a very I, thick Scottish accent. So That's uh, Karen Gillian, too. I know that. Oh, Karen, Karen's nothing. That's easy. You, nah. you, gotta, you gotta put some work into Grant. Now, come on. Well, that's one of my goals is eventually to get Grant Morrison on here. So, so Ross, I have a quick question for you. Um, I know I've heard <laughs> him and Warnell's. Um, you're, you've gotten into this partnership with, with Netflix, right? Well, yes, it's a first look television deal. Yeah. And I'm, I'm digging it. I'm, I'm when you, when it was announced that you guys did that, I'm like, Oh my God, they have so many properties that they That's can bring onto this. Thinking. Yes. I mean, thinking outside the box, getting into this relationship, like, quickly it was i was like oh my god this is fantastic can i can i pick it back up on lonzo too like when i first went to comic-con and i i mean this is back 2000 i mean let's say like 2014 when me and jr met room and uh roy was saying you guys need to go to boom Stu boom studios i didn't think i didn't know you guys were a comic book you know publishing company i thought you guys were like a movie studio yeah so that's where i need to piggyback on him like was this all in the making like the boom studio trademark Oh, uh, you're talking about like the core name of the company. Yeah. Yes. So, um, you know, I'm a little bit more like JR, which is I'm an old school comic book fan. And one of the things back in the original um, independence is that they would not necessarily name their company comics. And so you see it. I went to work at a company called Malibu Comics, but it was originally called Malibu Graphics. Oh my God, I remember that. Yes. Which is I have the first lead title. Uh, the original publisher of Men in Black, yeah. And um, the, uh, uh, for example, Mirage Studios uh, was the publisher of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And um, there's a lot of, like, Oni Press is like that, where they're not called Oni Comics, they're called Oni Press. And I think they were influenced by that same um, era. And so when I sat down to think about the company name, and I actually just did an interview with Sketched about this, where um, what, what, what you're thinking and you're going like, okay, which sounds cooler? Boom Studios, where the stew mm -hmm. sort of has the assonance of the boom, Right, Boom Studios sounds cooler than Boom Comics. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I, I just couldn't find a way to not say it out loud. Where I'm like, Boom Comics, you know, it yeah, just automatically 
gave me an East Coast accent, and I'm from Texas, and I don't want an East Coast accent. No offense to the East Coast. <laughs> I'm and sure it sounds like that Kaboom comics that they had back in the day, too. Yeah, well, we still have Kaboom. Yep. Yeah, we, we, we still put out uh, Kaboom. Kaboom is the material that we put out for kids, uh, yep. all ages content. We, we did a series called Met Cadet U that you'll probably be hearing more about. The next time we talk, you'll be like, you were keeping secrets from me. And I'll be like, yes, I was. <laughs> so I was going to ask with that whole Netflix deal, besides Berserker, because that's been announced. Yep. Do, do you have no. anything like I, I've also heard rumors about Proctor Valley Road? Well, there, there's no rumors. Let, let's let, I can tell you what's clear in black and white. Uh huh. And so Proctor Valley Road it results from a partnership that we have with a company called UCP. And what those letters stand for is Universal Content Productions. And it was formerly Universal Cable Productions which was the television studio that made the uh, cable TV shows for uh, the USA Network as well as the Sci-Fi Channel. And um, when everybody started to go streaming and cable was sort of yesterday, they changed it from cable productions to content productions. So that's a division of Universal Television, uh, NBC Universal. And so... Um, we partnered with them because we know the folks over at Universal uh, UCP and uh, have done a lot of business with them. And they've developed uh, different boom series as TV shows, none of which have come to fruition yet. Uh, but that uh, through that, we've gotten along really well. And they said, you know, we've got some stuff that we want to originate in the comic book space. And the DNA here is Grant Morrison did happy with them yes right yeah i mm -hmm. love so, that book so grant created the comic book he co-wrote the script and he was an executive producer of the show and so universal wanted to work with grant again and so it was like let's get all those folks together let's get grant who we has comic book bona fides let's get boom to publish the comic Boom is great at publishing and also is a producer of television content. We need a producer to produce the show. So they'll produce the show. Grant will write the script and Grant will write the comic and da 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 da. And so that's all very well documented online from the uh, public relations department from UCP. So I'm not breaking any um, secrets here. Uh, so if you were to say, oh, wow, it looks like they're developing a TV show, you would be, yes, that is exactly what they were saying in the article. So. We can't wait. That's, gonna be That's great. I mean, that that book, it's it, it got me hooked from the from the moment I read yeah. it. I was like, this is fantastic. It's well written and the art is goes along with it. So I'm really looking forward to um to the second issue and then what's going to happen with those with those teenage girls and how are they going to explain these missing boys i mean it's it, it's gonna be great yeah naomi's a real revelation and you know uh grant really went to bat for her and was a big champion of her work uh and i think she did such a spectacular job it was really impressive great it's you know great talent yeah. is there any books that you guys are publishing that are already known out there that you would say hey you should probably check out like any that we may not know yet not necessarily just, i don't want to care about the tv stuff but stuff i want to read well uh, so you know the thing that i always try to make sure everybody the path that everybody's gone through is if you like once a future excuse me if you like something that's killing children Check out Once in Future. If you like Once in Future, check out Seven Secrets. Mm -hmm. okay. Then we only find them when they're dead is so mind-blowingly huge and gigantic. And I mean, space gods and, you know. I will say I'm behind a couple of issues on that. Aesthetically pleasing to the eye. My God. Yes. The art is phenomenal. So gorgeous. So gorgeous. It's amazing. But, it, but it's a big, you know, it's a big... It's, it, it's a big um, idea. And, you know, I think like once in future and something is killing the children, or, excuse me, once in future and uh, seven secrets 
have a sweetness to them and there's a familial quality that they have that with the sort of big adventure backdrop and so i think they pair together nicely and you know erica slaughter's erica slaughter's erica slaughter i mean i don't yeah. think anybody doesn't like it you know once a future is a massive hit for us oh yeah it's mm -hmm. a huge book it's an amazing um, read yeah it's it's incredible so uh those are all big highlights that i would hit and say uh check them out and now i would add berserker to the list mm -hmm. and then past that you know we have a lot of other series that are uh wide ranging and very different and you know that's one of the things that i enjoy is i love all sorts of different kinds of stories and so I wanted a company that would do all sorts of different kinds of things so that I could hear a story that I was excited about and say yes and go green like that. So, you know, that that is the backdrop past that. A lot of it is, you know, Matt Kent did a series for us called Folklords, which I would recommend mm -hmm. people check out. It's a um, sort of reverse Harry Potter. You know, Harry Potter is in our world and he's kind of pulled into a fantasy world. This is a fantasy teen a teenager in a fantasy story, elves and dragons and everything. And he has these dreams that he is in our world. Oh, wow. So that's kind of a mind bender. Um, Jeremy Hahn did a great horror series for us called The Red Mother. That's 12 yes. issues. I love, I love that. that. Is it only 12 yeah. issues? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah so that, that's going to get to a big conclusion. So I think you'll, I think you'll find it satisfying. Don't worry, we'll we'll be. It's not the last you've seen of Jeremy Hahn at Boom Studios, okay. and um, then uh, I'm trying to think about you know for things everything I'm naming y'all have read. So I gotta I gotta find something that you haven't. <laughs> I've even heard your Power Rangers is really good. You know, Shattered Grid is an excellent read. Oh my god! I mean, I, mind you, it's for my friend that's a big Power Ranger fan, so. I actually, you know, I think that people like I, I'd give you an example of Brian from Simple Man's Comics. So Brian, he is not a Power Rangers fan and he picked up the Power Rangers comic and started reading it just as a comic and loves it as a superhero comic. Nice. And like he's not into the show. Yeah. So now I don't know that everybody's going to have that reaction, but it's certainly what you aim for. Uh, mm -hmm. Another book I'd recommend is The Last Witch. Um, it's this uh, fantasy story that we did. And, you know, if you kind of cock your head sideways, it's a little bit of a Disney movie. Uh, it's done a little bit more serious than something like Brave. Okay. okay. Or maybe a, a little bit more intense than Moana. Okay. But it's that female lead like Brave. The idea is there's a witch that lives in the woods. Um, she's been gone for a while, and um, she ha there's a ta she has a witch's tower, and basically the local boy challenges um, uh, the uh, lead character to you know who can get to the witch's tower first, and her mother had died. And her father has told her, whatever you do, don't ever go into the woods because a witch lives there. And so she goes into the woods and she goes and finds um, the witch's tower, uh, which is supposed to be abandoned. And guess what? It's, not. it's obviously not. It's not abandoned. And there's a little bit of labyrinth to it, too, which is she has a little brother on the journey with her and she oh, has nice. to rescue her little brother. So um, I think it's. Um, I think it's really, really strong, and I think that you'll enjoy it. So, awesome! Check it Very out. Very nice. Now, there is one thing that we like to close the show out with, and it's a rapid fire questions. And I know E got some ready and raring to go. So. Are you ready for this, Ross? Are you, are you ready? Okay, let's go, man. First, Ian, first the name of the company's not Wemper, Ian. Come on, man. <laughs> it's boom. Let's go. Boom. Here comes the boom. Let's go. All right. First question. First Comic Con ever. Oh, well, uh, 1982, San Antonio, Texas. Uh, Marv Wolfman was the convention guest. Oh, wow. Now, oh, wow. I love Marv Wolfman. If, uh, I do too. He's a terrific person. Now, if you're naming, if you're using the word Comic Con as to represent San Diego Comic Con, that would be um, July 1992. 
Wow, you're an OG. Dang. Wow, that's awesome. Wow. Yep. That's awesome. Before does before is the big thing it is now, huh? The little the, the big old monster. <laughs> oh um, yeah. I remember when Neil Gaiman's line was seven people long. And you and, wow. and most wow. and most people didn't have the patience to stand in it. You just wait <laughs> it to go down a little bit, and then you could go get his autograph. You want you want another thing about it, Ross? Is that's how that's how we all met in the line in Comic Con, San Diego wow. Comic Con, in the lines. Yep. I yeah, I love it. I love it. So love wait, it. wait, really, really quickly though. Speaking of Comic Con, what about Mini Con November of twenty twenty one? Are you guys gonna go? Yeah, I'm unfamiliar with Mini Con. Tell me about Mini Con. San Diego is supposed to have a because they're not gonna have a normal con this year. Oh. They're gotcha. talking about having a dialed back one in, in November. A little big one. We'll see how the vaccine rollout goes. You know, the thing that we've got to worry about is staff safety first. Definitely. Yep. All right. Number two, second favorite comic book in your collection. Second favorite. Second, because we all, yes, yeah, second favorite. We all know FF is it's not easy. First. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, this is where I, I you know, well, are you're saying single comic book or favorite series? Either one, either one. Mm, that makes it harder if it's either one. Um, let's see. <laughs> um, Inquiring minds want to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say probably up there is Uncanny X-Men 121. It's the first Alpha Flight. Because that was my first X Men comic, and um, that's has an indelible, made an indelible mark in my memory. Uh, really blew my doors off. All right, what's, what's your favorite plate to eat? Oh, your favorite uh, food? food. Favorite food. Uh, Mexican food all day long. Hell oh yeah. hell yeah! I'm, I'm talking you. about. Let's go. You yeah. you like that Texas style Mexican food? The 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 Texican. Yeah, I already know, uh, man. Yeah. Tex -Mex? Tex-Mex. The Tex-Mex. Yes, yep. sir. Yes, sir. And um, what's your kryptonite? Hmm. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you what you mean by kryptonite, and then you're going to say, answer it the way that you want to. So I'm going to skip <laughs> no. that part. No, no. <laughs> what's, what's, your, what's your, I mean, base, what's your weakness? And like in comic book collecting or? Or anything, anything uh, in your anything. life. In, in, yeah. life. Yeah. in life. In life. Ice in life, cream. yeah. What can you not say no to? Ice cream. Yes. 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 Particular yes. flavor dessert is my weakness. It's my kryptonite. What? Sometimes yeah. I order dessert first at a restaurant. <laughs> I'm, I'm a fat kid, and I've never even done that, Alonzo. Don't lie. <laughs> no, man. <laughs> no, <laughs> I've never done that. Dude, you I, better stop. I work my, my meals kick my ass around I doing that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Superman yeah. or Batman? Oh, that's interesting. You know, I think ordinarily I would say Batman. I'm, I'm not much of a Superman guy, but I've been thinking about Superman as a concept a lot recently, and I've grown to appreciate Superman. So I will say Superman. Okay. This might be a hard one, this next one. Did you watch the Justice League Snyder Cut? No. Okay. I have, I have little kids, and I don't have four hours. So. All right. Don't waste your hey. time. No, oh, come on. no, no. Three, it's three to one here. It's three to one. It was it's, uh, it's, a, pile a pile of poop. A pile of poop. If you binge who. anything or stream anything, just take it in chunks. Chunks. Just oh. like you would watch a Mar one of the Marvel, the Disney Plus uh, Marvel movies. Uh, favorite band? You too. Yeah. Oh, wow. Classic. Right, right. I like it. That was the first concert wow. I ever worked. Was a U two Pop Mart tour in a wow Oakland. That in that Oakland. was a great show, man. That was a great yeah. tour. Back in 97, I think. 96, 97. Yeah. Nicely yeah. done. Sure. All right. And last question. Top five favorite songs of all time. Oh, that's... I'm not going to be able to do that. Like, <laughs> um, My favorite song is the live version of Bad from YouTube. Yeah. And then yeah. I, I, I'll just answer this all U2 songs. So, uh, Let's go. Then my second favorite is All I Want Is You. Mm -hmm. And then I am the insane person that prefers the back part of Joshua Tree. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I think Streets of No Name is great. And I think With or Without You and all that is great. But I'll fast forward and go to like, I think it's track five or six. And when you get to like Red Hill Mining Town and running to stand still and like that exit and all that cuts. stuff, that's the stuff I love. Like yeah. that, that's, I that's, that's a true fan. 
Because I know, well, like, I'm that way with Zeppelin, too. It's like, I'll skip, like, Stairway to Heaven and... Where the Levy Breaks. Yep. Yeah, and I'll, I'll go to, like, some weird album. I'll, you know what I mean? It's, I won't go to, like, Zeppelin 1 through 4. I'll grow up... I forget uh, the album's names, but I'll go to some of the other ones. House of Holy right. and other albums and grab that. Well, if you want to play this experiment at home, my understanding of how the tracks uh, progressed was... I've forgotten who it was, but somebody's wife, it wasn't one of the band members. It was like the photographer's wife, or it was like the producer's wife or somebody's that was not a core band member's wife. They basically recorded all those tracks and then they gave that to the, to this woman to put in the order. Hmm. Oh, wow. And, and, and what the band realized after she did it was that she, she very cunningly got an audio progression. And so like when Bono talks about it, he talks about how it's super clear that that is absolutely what the order should have been. And so sit down sometime and listen to it stem to stern, like with no interruptions. And it's pretty incredible that it plays together like that. Like when you get to Mothers of the Disappeared, it's just, it, it's absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I think there's Do that as I'm editing this. Yeah, I think, I think you'll really enjoy it. And then uh, if we're going to play that game, JR, the other one, after you after you get done with Joshua Tree, go listen to Wide Awake in America. It's just a little EP that's four tracks. Okay. But, but that's a very satisfying uh, little chunk of time, little 20 minutes. Oh, yeah. I'm always down for more music. You know, I mean, I sit in front of a computer 10 hours a day listening to music. So I love it. I love it. Well, the, yeah. uh, after this, I'll shut up. But I think their most unappreciated album is Pop. Since you were at the Pop Mart tour. Yeah, I like Pop. Yep. yep. Me too. It's a good one too. Everybody overlooks it. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah, they need not overlook it. They need to pick that sucker up and play it in their car driving down PCH. That and you know mind blowing. What's crazy is that that, that, that that's uh the first the first song I ever learned on uh, guitar was it was a U two song. It's not coming to my head, but I know it's in D. You know, like uh oh. hit something off D. And I was like, dude, man, like, you know, been listening to him since too with you, man. But I'm going to turn it up to Steve, man, for, uh, you know, for his little MC commentary to, to, to ask to send us out, man. Well, well, well Ross, we want to thank you so much for joining the Team Nerd Herd podcast. And this has been a real treat. I, all of us are really big fans. And again, congratulations on everything and moving forward. And in the future, we are ready to see more. So with that being said, do you want to take us out Team Nerd Hurt style? If you want to do it right, collect what you like. Bam. Yeah. Bam. Thank you.